Welcome to our Good Friday service. Every year on this day, we take the time to reflect on the events of Jesus' death and burial, which takes us into the resurrection on Easter Sunday. All of this because of God's great love for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It, it was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Uh, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled. He said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Flowing down at the cross at 
we got to the garden um it's it just got crazy um jesus asked peter james and myself to go further in the garden with them and pray and we did we tried we kept falling asleep um jesus kept waking us up i remember one time he said the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak that's true it's all a blur. Uh, and I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek. That's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus... Jesus just reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. Mark chapter 15, verses 22 to 26. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. 
Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews.
Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 37. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. Didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, I mean, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd, and they, and they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, one minute, I, I am a man marked for death. And then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath and he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely, this man was the son of God.
Hey, it's Good Friday here, and we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark in our lead up to Easter, and now we've arrived at this this season. We're in Mark chapter 15. Well, we're a bit in the end of chapter 14 as well, but this is this is it. This is the end. We are coming to it. And the Gospel of Mark has been all about action. This is a theme that we've seen come up over and over again, that Mark is all about action. It's about Jesus's actions. We've seen Jesus heal. We've seen Jesus teach. Jesus has confronted and Jesus has comforted. But Good Friday is perhaps most about Jesus's inaction. And this is especially obvious when we look at the story of his trial before the Sanhedrin where Jesus doesn't do anything. He doesn't react to to insults or lies or threats. Jesus is quite passive in this part. And it's a, it's a real contrast to the rest of Mark. I don't know about you, but reading the trial, it, for me, is an exercise in frustration and fury and indignation and, and just wondering, Jesus, why didn't you speak up? Let's, let's read it together. Mark chapter 14, verses 55 to 64. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then someone stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. This trial is lies from top to bottom. And when they finally find something that's actually true and right, they declare that to be the lie and they kill Jesus for it. And yet, Jesus is silent as a sheep before the shearers. If there is action for us to study in this chapter, as opposed to inaction, if there's action for us to study, it is the actions of the disciples. Where are they? As Jesus promised, they have all abandoned him, even Peter. They abandoned Jesus when things did not go the way that they expected. They wanted a king, a conquering ruler, who would free them from their earthly bonds, to redeem them from their people's debt to Rome. They made big talk and argued about who would sit at his right and at his left. They made grand pronouncements about how they wouldn't let anything happen to him. But when the time came, they scattered. I've spoken before about reading the Gospels and trying to see myself in them, wondering where I would be which part I would be playing. In this section, I fear the best place that I can hope to find myself is in those disloyal and cowardly disciples. And I fear the accusation rings all too true. How many times have we in our minds had something in our minds of how something should go, the way we should expect it to turn out, and when it goes another way, We've questioned whether we should even stay with God. A job offer or a promotion that wasn't offered. Someone that we care about drifting into sin or suffering a terrible accident or or death. Oh, most of the time, we don't walk away from God. It's nothing so dramatic. But we decide to take a couple of days, weeks, or months off. We decide, I'm hurting. This is too raw. Maybe I won't go to church this week. Maybe I don't need to read my Bible today. Wow, that whole week went by without me praying. And then, like most of the disciples, we stumble back in 
acting like nothing has happened and hoping to just get on with our lives. Good Friday shines a light on the darkness of humanity. We see clearly our faults, our fears, our inability to change and turn, to heal, to restore. As a prayer of confession from the Presbyterian Church says, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. But Jesus knew this. Jesus knew the depth of our lost souls, the weakness of our humanity. And so when they manufactured lies, he stood silent. When they drummed up false charges, he said nothing. When they reviled him for telling the truth, he stood firm. As Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 9 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. God have mercy. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you Thank you.